Thank you. Well, thanks for coming today. This is being in healthy, thriving community together. Imagine that. So on that first page there you have, um, and I think the next slide, and you heard this already today. <clears throat> Rick Warren says we, have, we ask the wrong question when we ask how to grow a church. He says we can't grow a church. What we can do is create organisms, and healthy organisms naturally grow. So what do you think a healthy organism is? in terms of a church. What makes a church healthy? Community, love. Community, love. Common I'm sorry? Common goals. Common goals. Great, music. Great music, which we had today. Wisdom. Wisdom. Prosperity. Prosperity. Not just of money. Prosperous thinking, right? What else? What makes for a healthy church? Common purpose. Someone said goal. Yep. Strong leadership. So all of those things. All of those things are fertilizer, soil supplements, all those things that help grow. So when an idea is planted, it has an opportunity to grow. Right? So let's take a look at the next slide. Being in healthy, thriving community together. So what is the overarching intent? It's a good question. This is what this uh, says. The science of mind teaching is practiced and evident in all that we do say and be. What do you think about that statement? Hang on. Okay. Yeah. Sylvia. Preach. Practice what you preach. Yeah. What else? Science of mind teaching is practiced and evident in all that we do, say, and be. It's not part-time. It's not part-time. That's a good perspective. I like that better than all evident in all that we do. What else? The intention. Science of mind teaching is practiced and evident in all that we do, say, and be. Okay. How about the next statement? All is driven by the stated values, mission, and vision for the community. Well, yeah, it makes sense. But what if you don't know what the stated values, mission, and vision are for the community? need to have a road map. We need more information here, right? We don't really, we can't really say that we're all in 10 if we really don't know. Yes, Lorraine? Pardon me? I don't think so. Some of it may be, but it's an opportunity, right, for making sure that it is. Yeah. Yes? with our board and all of the members of the community. Yes, so th that's an essential part as well. Communication, transparency. Um, we need to make sure that we know the stated values. We need to know what, how do those values apply? So if we're talking about safety as a value for the community, how does that evident, how is that evident? How is that value seen as a behavior in the community? It's a challenge, isn't it? It's like, okay, well, we can assume that we know what it is, but maybe we need more work on that. So again, we're looking at the overarching intent. Hello, 
I have a question. Yes. Um, safety. We don't know what that means. Yeah. What does it mean to you? Uh, so you asked a question, I'm going <laughs> to put you on the spot. Well, I think of it in terms of having a safe space where what we are, who we are, how we speak is received and surrounded in love. Yeah. And so we can assume that, you know, Rachel knows this, but are we in alignment with what Rachel's saying? So it's just fleshing out these values to really get them, to articulate them, and really, so that we know when we see a behavior that's not safe, right? And we can encourage behavior that is, discourage the behavior that's not, and be okay with that. The third bullet point, ministers, practitioners, board members, musicians, staff, and volunteers are all steeped in and practicing science of mind at a high level. How does that fit with you, sit with you? Like it, maybe as an overarching intent. Okay. Yes. I think how you were sharing that your personal spiritual practice is what really. Oh, I think what you were sharing before, how your spir uh, personal spiritual practice sustained you when things had fallen apart. So I can't say we're in a place of falling apart, but our personal spiritual practice will sustain us individually and then as a group. Okay, so the statement is practicing science of mind at a high level. What you're suggesting is spiritual practice as evident. I just see a big difference there. Marjorie. It's what I call walking the talk. Mm -hmm. It means it, it takes practice, it takes spiritual practices that we use. But when we come out of the spiritual practice, am I still walking in alignment with what we believe? Am I walking with love? Am I walking non judgmentally? Am I walking knowing that each one of you is an expression of God? and each one of you is whole, perfect, and complete, and each one of you is a magnificent expression of that one loving presence. Okay. So I'm gonna challenge this. I'm gonna push a little harder on this. Is if I have a person that doesn't know the science of mine, but embodies almost everything that you said, am I, am I going to exclude them as a volunteer? You see how important it is to get clear on, on when we make statements about overarching intent, that we're really clear whether we do require the science of mind teaching to be at a high level. Because if they have a high level of emotional intelligence and they're friendly and their focus is on being a loving presence and expressing that, I don't need them to be at a high level of science of mind. I want them sitting here. I want them engaging everybody. And as that uh, space is created, where we feel that, they're gonna look around and say, I want what you've got. I wanna learn about the science of mind. But I don't wanna exclude anyone because they're not practicing at a high level of the science of mind. Is there a difference there? Yeah. So in terms of creating a thriving community, that's what we're talking about because otherwise it can be very insular, insular. I know a favorite saying years ago that I heard is science of mind is the best kept secret. <laughs> and wearing that is a badge of honor. It's like, well, you're talking about a club. A cult. A cult, <laughs> right? So I'm not saying the science of mind isn't important, I'm saying do we really want to exclude people because they're not practicing the science of mind at a high level? You're going to be able to get mu musicians in here 
that are practicing the science of mind at a high level. They're wonderful musicians, but maybe they don't really know anything about the science of mind. It's about a thriving community. The energy that Brian exhibited today just lifted everyone up. I don't know what his experience is with the science of mind. To me, it doesn't matter because he's exhibiting this tremendous t love through his music. So when we're talking about thriving community, just have to be careful. Okay, the next page. Four stable legs of the stool. The minister lives and embodies spiritual principle. How do we measure that? Well, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know how to measure it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> Right? Stands strong in spiritual leadership, provides inspiring, uplifting, and informative teaching and Sunday messages, is a strong presence of love and compassion to the community. That sounds pretty good. The board provides solid business and financial stewardship and oversight of the community's activities, has a collaborative, healthy relationship with the minister and the congregation. Does that make sense? Does that feel good? Okay. The next is practitioners provide clear, prayerful consciousness in support of everything unfolding in the community. How do we know what prayerful consciousness is? How do we measure the behavior of providing clear, prayerful consciousness? Yes. Pardon me? Highest good. Highest good. So they provide highest good. Okay. Hmm. And they provide that consciousness in support of everything that's unfolding in the community. Well, that's certainly as a, an intention is good, but as a practice, how do we know that's happening? Are the practitioners visible, available? Are the practitioners visible, available, and called upon widely by the community? I don't know, are they? Not. <laughs> some say yes, I see some heads shaking no. Is, the point is, is it important to know? There's no blame here, but is it important to know whether that service is being provided? Members. I put a question mark right after members. What are members? Do we know who the members are? Are they knowledgeable about all the activities of the center? Its values, mission, vision, and its finances. Do we want them to know? Okay. We want them to know. So is there a gap between this desire for knowledgeable about all the activities and where we are? It may, may not. For some things, other things, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But if it's an, uh, an overarching intention, then there may be some work to do. Are they actively engaged in sacred service and conscious financial giving? To some extent, right? To some extent, do we want more of that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then that becomes um, an intention that this is an area where we can improve, right? This is something that we can work on. Music ministry provides uplifting music consistently that complements and supports the science of mind teaching offered. Sounds like a pretty good intention, right? And so do you think we provide uplifting music consistently? Yeah. So that's, that's an intention that is pretty much fulfilled. That's exciting, right? And in mu music, ministry, professional attitude and approach. 
most of the time. Greeters, ushers, and welcoming team provide a strong presence of welcoming whereby people feel welcome on their first visit and people are systematically followed up with until they are enrolled in classes and service. I love it. I mean, you know, your experience is, this is a tricky one. Yes. This is, like, we were better at this before COVID. Yeah. Better before COVID. Oh, yeah. Yeah. COVID yeah. In what way? Can you elaborate that? We had a group of people that stood up front and hugged and welcomed people in. Mm -hmm. And we were, as practitioners, did it. Hello. <laughs> We had a team of people who were welcoming and the practitioners were out there. It was a whole crew. Mm -hmm. And then we just lost it with COVID. And now sure. we have Janice and Pam waving. Thank goodness they're still doing it. You know, and it it makes me feel really good when I walk in the door. Yeah, It's really important. So we, we kind of lost it. Yeah. But, I mean, we haven't lost it because we have Pam and Janice. Mm -hmm. But right. we lost the team. So there's an opportunity there. Darn it, building. back to work I go. <laughs> <laughs> and classes, right? What about the systematically followed up with? Marjorie. Well, there was a time when we had a plan of sending a card when someone came to visit the first time. I believe it was the minister that would sign it and send out a little card saying, so glad you came. I, came, I don't know where the card went. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it is, but we might, I'm looking at Janice, we might go and see if we can find anything because I think that is important. I know one time I went to visit when I was looking for another center to go to. One of the centers I went to, after I went, I got a personal letter, a personal card signed by the minister. Um, and I thought, wow, that really feels that really feels good. Yeah, that really feels good. So, another thing on the to-do list. Well, it is, and you know, we've just with the resources that we have, we can only do what we can do. But as an intention, it's probably really important to not only for the new people that come in, but for people that have always been here. How often do we reach out to people that have always been here? Because why do people come here? Yeah. And I was going to suggest that too, mm -hmm. because um, I don't know everybody here, and I've been coming for years. And I have been to some classes and stuff. But I'd appreciate if we all introduced ourselves to each other. I, I have friends <laughs> and stuff, but I'd, I'd like to know more of the people. I try to introduce myself, but I think that members also, just people need to, to introduce ourselves. And I'm Sue. My name is Jan the Magnificent. Ah! <laughs> Thank you. And I'm John the Joyful. <laughs> you, you see, one of the challenges, I, I heard um, Scientology. Now, Scientology is like over the top, but they do have systems in place. So let me tell you that in terms of the growth of a center, the minister can really only stay connected with a group of 10 people, maybe up to 30. So then how do you connect with the rest of the community? Well, you have to have a system to do that so that people are reaching out because people come here to feel connected to something bigger than themselves. Sometimes we don't know why people come, but they wanna make connection. And if we're not doing something to ensure that that connection, that that thread is unbroken, then who's going to do it? We can't always rely on Pam and Janice and Marjorie to do that. 
So that means creating something bigger than that so that nobody is left behind. Sylvia. Yes, uh, we had a card, and it must be, there must be a template somewhere that says we care. And the practitioners would send them out. Yeah. That's great. So that shows us, again, a little room for improvement. Yes. Pre-COVID. Thank you. Pre-COVID, um, I know that uh, some of us would go around, and if we saw somebody new in the church, we would sit down with them and uh, talk to them, what brought them here, uh, you know, what would you like to see? And, and so we were constantly going out there, and if somebody was new, we would sit down with them after service and communicate with them. Which is great. Now let me give you the other side to that. I can remember in our center we had specific people that would do exactly that. And we didn't have anything in place that would prevent that person being hit by all of those people that were selected. So they would end up having to tell their story to six or seven different people. And sometimes they didn't come back because it was like, it was too overwhelming. So you have that too. This is tricky stuff. Really tricky, but it's exciting because when it works, it works. Well, we'll soar, we'll soar. <laughs> yes. See, you didn't know what a runner would, what was entailed. Oh, thank you. Yes, I have the microphone. Uh -oh. Okay. So this is a little off topic, but I want to thank you for the, the Getting Better at Life seminar you gave last week. Yes. I am doing your techniques. I found the evening technique easier to do than the morning technique. The mm -hmm. morning's a little bit longer. But I love the laboratory you taught me how to do, and I have my consultants in there. Oh, and sure. it works every time, and thank you so much. You're welcome so thank much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So we're seeing some areas where, you know, just a little tweak here and there can really make a difference in building the thriving community or being in thriving community. So sacred service volunteers are well trained, are a good fit for the role they're in, and regularly provided feedback and support. How are we doing with that? Marjorie. Hang on. Oops. Okay. Carol Ann brought together a group of five of us now that are acting as hosts. And she did. She trained us for two or three Sundays. We went over the whole setup. And then we are now self-supporting, if you will. Lorraine has taken over as our, as our leader. And we meet every Monday to debrief and stay connected and stay with what's going on. And so um, I'm just thrilled that we have a, 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 a prototype, if you will. And so I see that expanding in the future. So important, template, prototype, whatever you want to call it, in terms of each group of volunteers are given the support they need to, to continue to want to be engaged. Because so often what happens without that support, people get burned out. They feel like what the gift that they're giving isn't being appreciated. And there's nothing sadder than that, is people want to be engaged, they come here to be engaged, they volunteer, and it's like, okay, they receive a check and nothing else happens. And so my caution there is, before we seek to expand, we focus on do we have the templates in place to expand? Because we don't want any, any engagement falling through the cracks of any person feeling as though they no longer matter, of the gift that they're giving of their volunteerism isn't appreciated. And that also means the person that is volunteering has to develop a voice where they can say, not for nothing, but you know, <laughs> I'm here every Sunday, or, or whatever it is. 
and feel safe that they can share that feedback with the group. That's a whole different level of speaking truth to, to so-called power, of saying, you know, this could be better if, and having someone there to listen to what they have to say. This isn't done overnight. It takes time. Most importantly, it takes the intention to do it. And I see that here. Rachel. Well, I guess I'll stand. I was struck by uh, a video I, I saw um, not, not too long ago uh, with Ricky Byers at the time when there was this huge chorus or choir, actually, that she um, was leading. And um, it struck me that, yeah, at first glance, it's easier because there's a big group and you know you have to be organized and you give feedback and you receive feedback. And then really, when we're starting kind of back at the beginning here, growing our, our congregation, um, even if there's two people doing some form of service, it's really good to have in place knowing that you're going to um, have feedback. You're going to give feedback to one another, receive feedback, take it in from the group around you, and see what's working, what isn't, what can be improved. Um, so it's not a matter of numbers. And I think if you start that right in the beginning of, of some new uh, service um, group, that, that, that grows that connection that then can uh, spread outwardly. So if that makes sense. Absolutely. That. Start with right where you're at, developing the templates and the forms that are gonna support one another. And that's doable rather than saying, oh, we really need to start another group or another group. It's like, yes, we wanna do that, but we can't grow a church. We need to create an environment where an organism that can, can thrive will be a place where that will naturally grow. So if we're with a small group of three people, which is really the minimum, and we can develop a place where we can share feedback, give and take feedback, and minimize conflict by getting it out, then that environment in those three people is successful. And when a fourth person comes, they sense that it's a safe place. That's how things grow naturally. Yes. I'm not talking for nothing here. Uh, <clears throat> name tags, plastic ones like that, but that say greeter. So the person that we're saying hello to knows that we have a function that we're not just trying to impose on their life or scrutinize them or you know follow them home yeah. and see what they've. You know. <laughs> uh, and we could have. 20, 30, 40, you know, keep one on your dashboard, you put it on when you get here, you take it, you know, always keep it handy. Whatever it is, yeah, right. whatever the system that, is. It, it kind of allows uh, two important things to happen. One, they, they feel like you know something about this center and you have a reason that they should talk to you. Mm -hmm. And two, um, I can't, I can't I just forgot it. <laughs> well, you're magnificent, you'll remember. Oh yeah, I'm magnificent, I'll remember <laughs> it. Yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Name tags are a great idea. The only caution I have with name tags as a man is staring at a woman's chest trying to read <laughs> her name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, and that's how you do remember. Yeah. But yeah, the placement of the name tag. <laughs> yeah, right up here. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what you do? Is eyes up here, guy. <laughs> All right, sacred service volunteers. Is that where we're at? Volunteers are well trained, are a good fit, and regularly provide. Yes, we did this one. But are they well trained? I mean, that's so we see that, you know, with the um, host MC group, that was right on. That worked really well. So we want to 
replicate that. Office staff, knowledgeable, well-trained, accountable to the minister and board, kind, compassionate, and responsive to the membership, clear boundaries. What does it mean? We can't ask for anything more wonderful than the work that Janice is doing. So one of the important values is mentoring, of teaching someone else what you do in this community so that you can then move on to something different, a greater purpose or whatever it is. So all the things that Janice is doing, it would be hard to find one person to, to do all of those things, half as well as she does them. <laughs> With kindness and compassion. Just yeah. yeah. Amazingness each and every day. Yeah. yeah. So does that put tremendous pressure? pressure? Um, I mean, it could. It could. So what are some of the solutions to that? Hello. Oh. In, her, in her instance, this instance with Janice in an office, um, maybe she could get an assistant, a volunteer assistant, somebody from the congregation or who is just coming in and wanting to feel a part of what we're doing. And through seeing the spiritual qualities uh, playing out in a real world, may feel themselves brought in more closely to real values that we give lip service to and see how we can actually translate that into living them. Yes. And to be really clear about this, between Janice and Marjorie and Pam, there's an extraordinary chemistry there of delegating back and forth and brainstorming, and it's a very unique thing. And so that can't last forever. And so it means how can we start mentoring that process so that it can, that we don't lose anything? I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's important to acknowledge that that wonderful chemistry exists. And these women are doing an extraordinary job for this community. And it's, it's a point of strength and vulnerability. So we have to look at that. Lorraine, did you have a question? I think you did. Yeah. Uh, Hang on. <laughs> Getting my step Thank here. you, Ms. Renner. And also, as you bring in your staff to mentor, Janice can get some more sacred rest and spiritual practice <laughs> and recreation and rejuvenation. This is good for each and every one of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the point of mentoring is that it takes some pressure off that you can be present to, more present to whatever is going on. So if you have a situation where extra grace is required you can come from a place of fullness rather than emptiness. Janice has the microphone. I just wanted to say something that happened today that Marsha, um, if you all don't know Marsha, this is Marsha over here. She made an offer. She came up and said, you know, I've got some uh, gardening tools in my little bag here because I've noticed things look really kind of, um, I don't know, she said a very lovely word, that, but dead. <laughs> Um, we can honor that word. <laughs> yes, look at this. And I, it just got me thinking, you know, how cool would it be if we had just this little team of adopt a planter? You know, we have these lovely planters. If, if we got like, we probably would need 15 or 20 people just adopt one planter and pay attention to it. Does it need some succulents in there? Does it need something pulled out? 
because in addition to doing the office work, apparently I'm also the landscaper. <laughs> and I'm not, that's not really one of my gifts, which is why a lot of things look dead. Um, but how cool would that be? I love I, it. I love I know. it. You know, and that's the thing to do in terms of mentoring is where's the low hanging fruit? <laughs> the stuff that can be easily delegated. And by the same token, not getting upset when someone lets the thing die. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the other part of mentoring is, you know, it's not always going to work, but it does relieve some of the pressure. Marjorie. I would just like to say that the three of us do have an amazing chemistry, and it's because of what you've been teaching us. I think we already had it, and it's called extraordinary respect. So when one of us makes a mistake, we just laugh. <laughs> you know, what do we do next? It's no big deal because we know and honor who we are so deeply, it doesn't matter what happens on the one off here, one off there, because we've all been one off at some point or another, and it, it's just no big deal. And it's so, that's what makes it safe because I know they're not going to come down on me and say, why did you do that? You could have done it better. Who did you? Who? None of that happens. Yeah. It, it just, we laugh and we go forward. It's, and it's a joy to be in that. It yeah. makes what we do fun. And can I say, that permeates in here. I feel it when I walk in the door. That's what we're talking about. You know, the soil is well fertilized, so when things are planted, they naturally grow. They naturally thrive. And one person claiming a potted plant, I mean, you know, and, and the evidence of their commitment becomes evident really quick. <laughs> All right. Um, and the last part of that is clear boundaries, and that can be a hard one to establish in any group is, you know, what are the boundaries here? So how do you establish clear boundaries? Pardon me? Write it down. Write it down. When this happens, what do we do? Right? It takes attention, intention and attention to do these things. So I have a question. How do we close those gaps between values and behaviors? Because that's all we've been talking about, is if we're going to require every single musician, practitioner, volunteer to be at the highest level of science of mind, that's a value, right? And it's to be celebrated. But in terms of the behavior, is it realistic? Probably not. Probably not. And is that what we really want to create? Is this insular group of people that will be practicing at that high level, but maybe they can't communicate with one another? <laughs> practicing the high, highest level of science of mind doesn't necessarily um, absolve you from being in alignment with confronting people with conflict. What I've seen is people that operate at the highest level of science of mind very often bypass difficult to have conversations because they'd rather keep a positive outlook on, we're all one, we're all in this together, life is good, and it's like, well, don't, don't darken that positivity with your stuff. And I'm here to tell you the only way through everyone's stuff is by facing the hard to have conversations, the conflict, the stuff that doesn't feel good until that can be surfaced. And very often when it's surfaced in a way that people feel safe can be resolved and taken care of right there and then. Because the worst thing is for you to bury it and have a whole cemetery of resentments, you know, with the tombstone that says, this person betrayed me here, and this one here, and this one here. You know, you can practice at the very highest levels of science of mind, but something's going on there that you're not paying attention to. 
At least that's what I've seen in my experience. So we want to be very careful about limiting, you know, our um, behaviors by a strict value that is unrealistic. Is that making sense? Okay. So the next page, it says, and so this is an example of the type of skills that we have to learn. Being in healthy, thriving community together, healthy communication and relationships. I am responsible for my experience. Not the person that screwed up the order of service on Sunday. As you were saying, you can laugh about the mistakes that are being made because we each recognize that you're responsible for your own experience. I attract to me those people who support my spiritual growth. What does that mean? I attract to me those people who support my spiritual growth. What you're vibing out. Yeah. So if someone comes to you that is very confrontational, is that a consequence of attracting someone who is supporting my spiritual growth? Marjorie. Sometimes the greatest. <laughs> Sometimes that turns out to be my greatest teacher. There you have it. Learning how to deal with that with love and compassion can be a chore. And the tendency is to tell a story about them. You know, it's not about my spiritual growth. They must be dysfunctional, crabby, whatever, whatever. And instead of realizing what a great opportunity, I just want to jump in with all my enthusiasm and joy into this <laughs> opportunity for spiritual growth. <laughs> but the reality is that's what it's all about. The guy cuts you off in traffic. What a great opportunity. You know, you may not look at it that way, but that's what spiritual maturity is. Developing spiritual maturity is going to that point of recognizing if I'm triggered by that, then that, there's something that I need to learn, not the other person. Not necessarily. Okay. 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 So that, that's all I have to say about that. So that as a teaching tool, we have to preface that with saying, you may be triggered by some of the things that you read in here because the gender identity is not as it should be. Right. But that's how, what we have to work with. How often can you keep picking a hammer to somebody's big toe without them needing to confront that and say, no, I've got a set of boundary here. Stop hitting my big toe with that hammer. And we need to discuss that in a safe, loving, supportive environment. Why? 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 Because I don't feel safe necessarily sharing that with people that are going to um, present an opportunity for confrontation. I want to be in a situation where I can feel that I can speak my truth and allow them to speak their truth, and we can have a discussion rather than what we're seeing in this country of divisiveness. So that's what I mean by a safe environment. I, I hear all that, but I also want to just, I don't want to take a devil's advocate position here, but if God is all there is, and we are equipped with the ability to feel and express anger as a boundary, and that anger makes you unsafe, you the perpetrator is unsafe because you've made me angry, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, God is all there is. God is in the confrontation. God is, is all there is. It's not just the nicey-nicey. And the churches that have that sugary glaze over everything feel so false, it will make people run for the hills rather than the authenticity of God being all there is. Well, and I think we did discuss that. We're is not that's... take a hatchet out and hurt somebody, but we can confront with the full range of emotions that we are meant to confront with. In a space that is safe and trusting. It, and unsafety is also a thing of God. Absolutely. But in community, we have to be able to handle that, which means we have to have the training to know how to handle the person with a hatchet. 
right? So, you know, we use the resources that we have and we can't guarantee all the time that it's not going to trigger somebody and I refuse to give a trigger warning for everything that comes out of my mouth. I am not going to do that, but I'll meet with the person afterwards and do counseling session and do whatever I have to do to reach an agreement about where we're at. Okay? I can't protect people from anything that's going on in your hearts, minds, or souls. That's your business, and you get angry, that's your business. It's not mine. Right? I didn't make you angry. That's something inside of you that made you angry. And then let's talk about that. Yes? I'd like to bring up that in the Science of the Mind magazine, whenever they are quoting something from Ernest Holmes, they bring that fact up. That because of the times, he says the he or the, and that that is not the sign of our times. I, those aren't the exact words, but they bring it up. They bring a, a qualifier up in the Science of the Mind magazine. In a lot the of the new publication, whenever. they're doing a pretty good job. They do. I agree. Yeah, they do. Whenever of being gender specific. Bio, Ernest Holmes, yeah. they do. And in all the classes that I've attended, they have also stated that. Yes. Why don't we just change the literature? Hang on, hang on. Well, it's who has the resources to change all the literature. I mean, it's a huge, huge job yeah. just in the classes to make them more gender friendly. Right. You know, so it, it's, I applaud what the organization is doing to change the new stuff. And with the old stuff, if you feel called to do something about it, then it's your calling to do. I mean, that's all I can say. It's because the, the home office does not have the resources to reinvent everything that has been written. And maybe it's, you know, I don't know what the solutions are, but there's that. Marjorie. I'm, I'm kind of going on another topic because you t talked about being cut off in the freeway. And um, I was teaching a class and realized I had used language I don't usually use about the guy who <laughs> pulled in front of me. And um, I used it because I was teaching the class. Lots of times when you teach a class, you learn what you it's because of what you want, you need to learn. And what I realized was my upbringing was very, don't waste any time. And so I would work right up to when I had to go to this other appointment. So I didn't have time for somebody to get in front of me. And if I had let go of that, don't waste any time, um, I started a new intention, which was to leave five or 10 minutes early so I don't have to worry if someone comes in front of me, I say, well, he must really be in a hurry. And it's amazing the difference. That's funny. Um, one of the things that got me out of that was reading an article that they've done traffic studies, that weaving in and out of traffic to try and get an advantage doesn't work at all. Yeah. You do not gain anything by trying to do that, unless you're Reverend Kath. <laughs> and what she says is, low. <laughs> and, the, and the C's part, and it, it, I've seen it too many times, is God is my witness. <laughs> we had a question over here. <laughs> Hang on. That freeway thing. Sometimes I just say, um, "Oh, I'm getting there at the perfect time," you know. But but back to what, before uh, what you said about trusting versus non-trusting relationship, and what that woman over there—I don't know if that was magnificent Janice or not. But anyway, um, I just just want to remind us of that one uh, that one saying: um, "I may have pressed your buttons, but I didn't install them." You know. So uh, we, we we take responsibility for yeah, sure. our lesson, our awarenesses. <laughs> Um, it, isn't the bottom line really that we have a choice on how we're going to react to a situation? If you just take a minute and take a breath 
and choose not to respond or react negatively, it, it just makes you feel so much better and yes. more in control and, and it's just healthier. Yes. I have a whole workshop that I do on a key moment. So a key moment is somebody cuts you off in traffic, right? Immediately you put a meaning on that, right? And the meaning might be, I'm not going to let that son of a gun in. And then there's an emotional thing that you feel. And so it may be that you get angry. And then the next thing is there's a behavior. And so you cut them off. In between each of those steps, there's an opportunity to shift consciousness. It's a choice of saying, even after you have the meaning that this person's, this son of a gun's trying to cut me off, the next step can be, I'm, it's an interrupting strategy. I can put the music on, relaxing music. Or something as simple as, I can take three big deep breaths and then put some music on and then come up with the uh, idea of, I'm in the flow, I'm in divine right action. The behavior ends up differently, the consequence is different. But we let these response chains take us, take control. And then we end up in a messy situation with the cops, blue lights are spinning behind me and I'm the one being pulled over, right? So we do have a choice at those different segments to interrupt the inevitable response that we don't want to say, I can do this better. I can do this differently. Got about five minutes left, and the real juicy parts <laughs> are coming. So this will be work that you can do on your own. But it says, are your personal values and beliefs in alignment with this community. So you have an opportunity to rate yourself on a scale of one where it needs some work, or five, yes, I'm totally sure that my values and beliefs are in alignment with this community. And the question that I ask, well, how do you know? What is the behavior that you're seeing that would give evidence that your values and beliefs are showing up, okay? That might be an easy one. Second one is not so easy. Are your personal values and beliefs in alignment with your behaviors and actions? Therein lies your path to God. If I say that I want to, and I use this one in my talk, if I say that I want to be mindful in my eating, what do I do about the behavior where the orange from the Cheetos is on my fingers while I'm watching TV, you know. And it's not wrong, it's just give up one or the other. Or if, if you rate yourself a three on that, do you really have a desire to go to five? So it's a, an opportunity to see the kind of work that you can, you can do. The next is, are the actions and behaviors of leadership in alignment with the values and beliefs of the community. So are the behaviors of leadership in alignment with the values and belief? So if we say that are the, belief, the community belief is there's only one life, does the leadership always behave as if that is true? Or do they have stories about, well, you know, this person is always just dis disruptive or you know, we never can get um, enough people here on Sunday. Or there's not enough in the plate to really pay for a new minister. I'm saying if the leadership is really focused on that, is that in alignment with the teaching, with the values and beliefs that we have? And it's okay if it's not, but it's an opportunity to say, why is this showing up? What can we do about that? So there's a couple of pages of this. Are the actions and behaviors of leadership in alignment with the action and behaviors of this community? In other words, are we in integrity in how we operate? So the community is defined as the ministers, the leadership council, the practitioners, all the committees, the youth program, the volunteers. 
are the behaviors of people in leadership in those things in alignment with the actions of the community? Okay? And the last one is, are the actions and behaviors of the community, all of these different structures that we have, in alignment with the values and beliefs of the organization? So the answer to those provide insight into areas that we need to work to close the gaps. And if we can't close the gap, then we've got to release the value and belief or the behavior on the other side. There's no other way to look at it. And, or we could just not do this stuff. And, and a lot of churches wing it, hoping for the best. And they can last several years hoping for the best. My approach is a little more linear. Because what I know about being linear and having systems is then you see innovation come out. It's like the rules in football. You know, you have boundaries and guidelines and first downs and goals and all of that stuff. Everybody agrees on the rules. And then you have tremendous creativity and innovation, and it allows the excellence of their athleticism to come out. Because they know they can't cheat by running out of bounds and then sneaking back in bounds to catch a pass. I mean, you know. So the, the boundaries help you to focus on achieving the goal. And that's really how you create a thriving community. Last page, are there gaps? So this is where I promote the care group structure, the, the structure that we're working on in our different groups. We learn how to practice, as, as Marjorie said, extraordinary respect. And it's designed to help close the gaps, create greater motivational alignment when three people in a group can come to consensus that we can have discussions, arguments, share the joys, et cetera. What happens to motivation in that group? goes up. When motivation is up, what happens to creativity and innovation? It expands and grows. Um, so that's really what this is about, is with, with greater motivational alignment, we find greater engagement throughout the entire community. That's what we're building toward, is finding those motivational links that really want, make people want to be here and want to participate and want to enjoy the feelings that they have when they come here. 12.30 on the button. Any comments, questions? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Happy to do it. Thank you. I'll be here next month. I don't remember the date. 8th through the 18th, something like that. 8th through the 18th. You're welcome.